Uh, so as many of you have already either told your mothers or if you are, if some, maybe somebody has told you, happy Mother's Day today. Uh, maybe a quick question. What do you think is one of the number one concerns of mothers for their children today? If you had to survey them, maybe, th you know, historically they would say, well, we want our mother or our kids to maybe grow up to be independent. We don't want them living in our basement forever. Uh, we maybe uh, pray or maybe they hope that their kids grow up to get a good job, uh, maybe get a good education, uh, find a God-fearing spouse. You know, those historically were some of the, the things that were in surveys. If you had asked today, though, and you can find surveys, all different surveys, right? But numerous surveys that I looked at, what are the hopes of mothers and or just parents in general? for the next generation, or for their kids. The number one thing, safety. Uh, physical safety followed up very closely by one percentage point, online safety. And so that was, it's kind of interesting that, and, and you see that this, this idea of safety permeating our society today. I mean, you just think about how much of life is, is all about being safe, whether it's safe to sleep campaign for, for infants or it's safe routes to school for, for kids riding a bus or as adults, we have all these safety measures, right? Ever since 1971, there's a thing called OSHA uh, so that now 130 million or whatever workers across the country are, are under their guise for safety. I mean, I remember working in a factory for my summer job and I can still see the the big banner hanging over the, the shipping department says, safety first, safety first, safety first. Safety is a big, big deal. Um, maybe it wasn't always, right? I, I remember back, uh, you know, you just think about how it's grown in maybe the course of your lifetime. So I remember when I was four years old, we got a, a brand new car, a 1979 Oldsmobile Delta 88. And if, if there were... Any trips that we were going to take where it was more than an hour, there were three kids in my family. How would we sit in that back seat? One would lay across the ledge on the top by the speakers. One would lay across the bench it's, or the seat itself. And one would lay across the floor trying to navigate that big hump in the middle. And if dad pumped the brakes a little too fast, you'd roll off the top onto your sister uh, who's laying on the floor. And that, but it was fine, right? But now, now if, if we were that same age today, two of us would be in booster seats and one of us would have a shoulder harness. Uh, we're all about safety. You know, that, that point was kind of brought home to me too. I, one of the websites that I love to see, just to, to think about what people are talking about, it's a, it's a website called Ngram. It, it matches or looks at how often a word is used in literature and magazines and that type of thing. So I just typed in the word safe. And this is the graph to see how it has escalated. Uh, the low point was about 1979 when I was a four-year-old rolling around in my, the backseat of that Oldsmobile. But ever since 1979, it has just shot up. And what's crazy to me about this graph is that this graph always takes a few years to catch up. This is only through 2019. Can you imagine what it's going to be when it includes 2020 and 2021? When we heard all these campaigns, stay home and stay safe, or, or wear a mask and be safe, or even the way that we say goodbye to each other. And I, I personally don't say it, but twice this week we're having pizza with our neighbors, and we say goodbye, and they said, stay safe. And then Friday, I left the office, and I was talking to the worker uh, next door, and she said, stay safe. I said, oh, guess what? You just made my sermon this week, so it's already printed. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that almost becomes a familiar goodbye now. Be safe. Stay safe. It is, it is an obsession of ours. In some ways, a good obsession. Maybe in some ways it can go too far and it becomes worry and even sinful. But being safe is a good thing. And do you know who else was obsessed or is obsessed with safety? And that's Jesus. 
In a good way, Jesus is obsessed, has an obsession with your spiritual safety. When we think about Jesus keeping us safe, one of the most beautiful pictures, again, is what we've been looking at so far today, that Jesus is our good shepherd, someone who holds us safe in his hands, holds us safe in his arms. And, and one of the, um, I, you know, we, we already read Psalm 23. That is the most popular chapter to describe Jesus as the good shepherd who holds us safe. A second, a very close second, though, would be John chapter 10. John 10 also really lays out what it means that Jesus is our shepherd. And we're going to be looking at at four verses from John chapter 10. What's interesting, though, about the context is that Jesus is in a very unsafe environment. He is worshiping, or he goes to the temple area, not in the temple itself, but just kind of onto the temple square, and, and there was a, an area of that temple square, they called it Solomon's Colonnade, which was kind of like the porch, and it had all these big columns. And he's getting cornered. He's getting bullied by other people who kind of have him surrounded, and they're, they're bullying him. They're saying, come on, answer me this, and answer me that, and answer me this. And then, so that's how it starts. And at the end, those same bullies are picking up stones and ready to to hurl him at Jesus. And it's in between those two points where they have him cornered on the porch and where they're about to hurl stones at him that Jesus shares with us some of the most beautiful words to describe how we are safe. And so as we read these words from John chapter 10, I want you to look uh, for five, a handful of blessings a handful of assurances that we have that we are safe in our shepherd's hands. And so Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my hand. I and the Father are one. Now, some are more obvious than others as far as phrases that maybe assure us of our safety here. Well, let's just start off at the top where it says this. It says, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. You know you can be safe under your shepherd's hands simply because of the fact that he speaks to you. That he speaks to you. I don't know if we always think about that. You know, especially maybe even on Mother's Day. Maybe mothers, you know, you want nothing more today than peace and quiet. You know, maybe dad, take the kids away. That's what I want for Mother's Day. Um, Or maybe there's that annoying voice. uh, Mom, mom, you just don't want to hear that. And so maybe you don't always think it's safe when you hear a voice. And it doesn't have to be parents. It can just be maybe there are people in your life that you're like, I just don't want to hear their voice. But the flip side of that, can you imagine if someone never communicated to you? Or if no one ever communicated to you? What that would be like? The the psychological warfare of of always being on the, the bad end of the silent treatment? Uh, you know, there's there's some psych studies done with that too where where it says they call them victims, victims of, of the silent treatment. Uh, they would say, feel worthless, unloved, hurt, confused, frustrated, angry, and unimportant. All words that are just the opposite of what Jesus wants you to feel. Jesus considers you to be worth something. That's why he came. Jesus wants you to know that you are loved. Jesus wants you to know that you are important. Therefore, what does he do? He speaks to you. When someone speaks to you, you know, we often talk about we want to be heard, but sometimes we want to hear. When someone thinks I'm worth talking to, That's what Jesus does for you today. 
he speaks to you. And, and I don't know if we always think about that, that comfort just from, with the existence of this book. That, that the Lord communicates to us is nothing short of a miracle, and it's super comforting. I, I, I think of a, a conversation this week. I, I had a, a dear friend who, who really needed some encouragement and some spiritual guidance this week and, and, and something going on in his family. And so I, I spent probably a good 45 minutes carefully crafting an email to him choosing my words carefully, making sure that my tone was there and I made sure that he heard my concern in his voice, that I, that I knew he was important and I, and I wanted him to be comforted. And, I, and you know, I, I sent that email off and it was 1,277 words. And then I think about what Jesus does, that he communicates us with us with 727,969 words carefully crafted not over the course of 45 minutes but over the course of 1600 years that he watched the development of this book of these truths to assure you how much you are worth to assure you of how much he cares for you how much you are loved assuring you that, that you are safe under him as your shepherd. That's number one. Assurance number two, and we go on here to say, so not only do my sheep listen to my voice, Jesus goes on to say, I know them. Now there are multiple ways to know someone. You can know about someone or of someone, or you can know them personally, right? I, I know about Johnny Depp because he's on court TV all the time now, right? Um, but I don't know him personally. I don't know him like I know you. I don't know him like I know my kids. I don't know him like I know my, my spouse. There's a difference between surface knowledge and heart knowledge. And what's really interesting here is that this word that Jesus uses, he says, I know my sheep, I know them. It's not just surface knowledge. This word has this idea of he, he knows you intimately, that he, he knows you deep within. That he knows you better than your best friend knows you. He knows you better than your mom knew you when you were just an infant. He knows you, this word actually has this idea that he knows you better than you even know yourself. You know, and that can be kind of intimidating. Scary. To know that Jesus knows me better than myself. That means that he knows all of my shortcomings. <laughs> There's nothing I can hide. He knows the way that I have disregarded his commands. He knows the way that I have despised his name or, or, or just struggled in living a Christian life. Yeah, he does. But it also means that he knows all of your needs, including that you need a Savior. How did that song go that we just sang? I know that I am Jesus' little lamb. There's that one line in there. Knows my needs and well provides me. That he provides me with everything that I could have ever possibly needed. Even more than what I even thought I needed. That is what assures us. That yes, we are safe in our shepherd's hands. Jesus knows you. Number three is this one. That Jesus leads you. Uh, Jesus in, in John 10 says, My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Now, following a leader, maybe, oh, I don't know, doesn't always have the best connotation. I think we always strive to be at the front of the line, right? And we almost see following as a sign of weakness. Not so. Not so. In fact, when you follow Jesus, it's not a sign of weakness at all. It's, it's a sign of toughness. 
Because when Jesus invites people to follow him, he doesn't say it's going to be a walk in the park. He says, you're going to have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. It's going to be really tough. And so it's not at all a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of wisdom when you pick who you follow. I mean, and it says a lot about you. You know, I, I could look at your, who you follow on a podcast, or I could look at who you follow on, on social media, and I, I would learn a lot about you that way. And, and so, too, when you follow Jesus, it says a lot about you. And it actually is one of the, it is the wisest thing we could do. Because where does Jesus lead? Again, you go back to that Psalm 23. Psalm 23 where it talks about Jesus as that good shepherd. And I, the Lord is my shepherd, I, I shall not want. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Quiet waters, that's a safe place. You know, for your, the, the people out there who maybe have a toddler, if you take a toddler or even a, a, a mid-sized child to a, a water park, do you take them and put them in the big kahuna wave pool where they need to sound the siren to warn you it's coming? No, you take them to the, to the zero entry area where they're safe. Or if you're just learning how to swim or you're, you're taking somebody swimming for the first time in their life, do you, do you take them to the Truckee River when it's really flowing well? No. You take them to a little inlet in a lake, you know, maybe you'll freeze at Sand Harbor, but at least it's safe in that, that little inlet where it's so shallow. That's where Jesus takes you. He doesn't take you to the roaring rapids. He doesn't take you to the big waves. He says, no, I lead. I lead to the quiet waters. Number four. He goes on to say, not only does he want to keep us safe in this life, but he says, I give them eternal life. Ultimately, that is where Jesus leads. And ultimately, that is the safest place to be. I mean, we, we saw a glimpse of that in that Revelation reading earlier. Where here's John, one of Jesus' followers. He does not feel safe. He's been exiled because of his faith. He's on an island all by himself. The church is being persecuted. All his friends are dead, and he's like, I don't feel safe at all. And Jesus pulls back that curtain and shows him how safe it's going to be. He shows him the safety of heaven where there are people from every nation, tribe, language, and people, and where they're singing and saying words like praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever, amen. That is the picture that Jesus ultimately shows as this is what safety looks like. But what's so interesting, what Jesus says here, is that he doesn't say, I will give them eternal life. He says, I give them eternal life. Present tense. In other words, Jesus is already leading you, has led you to a safe spot. It's maybe not as safe as heaven, but you already have a taste of it. I mean, you look in this room, uh, we aren't all the same. We don't all come from the same walk of life or the same backgrounds. We are a picture of what heaven is. People of every nation, tribe, language, and people. We're maybe not as diverse as, as heaven is going to be, but we're not all the same. The fact that we're all here gathered today is, a, is already a testimony that we are safe, that, that we are a picture of what that ultimate safety is. Or you think about what they were singing in heaven or saying in heaven, praise and thanks and honor and glory are yours. Well, what are we going to say in a little bit at the end of the Lord's Prayer? For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. We already have eternal life. We are starting to already benefit from the blessings of eternal life, assuring you, more is to come assuring you that you are safe in your shepherd's hands. And it's the fifth point, though, that Jesus makes here that is maybe the most obvious. 
as far as our safety. When he's talking to the enemies, what does he say? He says, he holds us. He says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. So not only does Jesus speak to you, Jesus knows you, he leads you, not only does he give you eternal life, he holds you. He holds you. And maybe that's the picture that we so often associate with Jesus as that good shepherd. We see him, those pictures that are, or sketches of Jesus holding the lamb in his arms, holding the sheep over his shoulders as he walks. That's what he promises to you. And whenever I read this verse, you know, that no one will snatch them out of my hand, I, I think of just the opposite sometimes. I think of those horrific scenes that you maybe see on a movie or once in a while hear about in a newscast where someone is holding a child and, and there's a kidnapper <laughs> that's trying to be the baby snatcher. And that mother loves that dear child. And she is trying to run away, and she is screaming at the top of her lungs, and she is fighting back. And yet what happens in some of those movie scenes? The kidnapper overpowers her, and he takes away that child. That happens. But not for Jesus. No one. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And you think about how comforting that is especially when there are kidnappers out there who are much more powerful than anything you see in the movies. I mean, the devil would, have, would want nothing more than to, to tear us away from Jesus' grip. The world would want nothing more than for us to, to follow its lead instead of Jesus. And yet, what does Jesus promise here? Find comfort, especially the way it starts. No one. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You are firmly in the grip of Jesus. And if that's not enough, Jesus doubles up on that here. As he says, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. Two grips on his sheep. Two hands on his lambs. One that is scarred, which is a testimony of his love and commitment. The other is the creator hand. Testimony of his power and his protection. And those are the hands that hold you. And when you apply that, to yourselves, or to your loved ones. There is no greater feeling than that. You know, I, I shared a little bit uh, with some of you walking in today, but, um, and, and I, every family has their own issues, I get that, and every family has their own challenges. Uh, one of our challenges, our boys get concussions, right? So this week, my 20-year-old got a concussion playing baseball, and then, so you're worried about him. And then last night at 11 o'clock, the phone rings, and our other son gets a concussion for his eighth time. And, and so that's where Mary is. She's on a plane right now uh, to see him. But, you know, you, you, as a parent or as anybody who loves anybody else, you worry. You worry when any of that stuff happens. And I realize, again, concussions don't match cancer or other diseases or diabetes or whatever it is. But no matter what challenges are maybe facing you or your loved ones, to have this truth, to say no one will snatch them out of my hand. It doesn't matter what physical ailments they have. But you have that comfort that their Heavenly Father and their Savior is holding them both. Holding you both. Or 
both hands holding you. That is what comforts us. That is what assures us that we are, are safe. You know, when, when our kids were little and we'd put them to bed, you know, we'd go through the routines, brush your teeth, put on your PJs, and go through our prayers. And, and the prayer we would always say was, Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. Bless your little lamb tonight. Through the darkness, please be near me. Keep me safe. Keep me safe till morning light. Through Jesus' life and through Jesus' death and his resurrection, we know that was, we always knew the answer to that prayer. It was always yes. You are safe. No matter who you are, you are safe in your shepherd's hand because you have those, that handful of assurances from him right here. Remember that he speaks to you. Remember that he, he leads you. He knows you. He gives eternal life to you. And ultimately, he holds you. So cherish. Cherish that truth. That you are safe in your shepherd's hand. Amen.